For some of us, Hanukkah is kind of a foreign thing. You know, it's not, it doesn't quite make the list of the typical Christian traditions or Christian holidays that have existed for 2,000 years or whatnot. Uh, you know, typically you have Christmas and Easter and so on and so forth. And Hanukkah, um, why? Why Hanukkah? So we're going to talk about that uh, as well. And uh, the thing about Hanukkah, what's so interesting, is John. John intentionally mentions Hanukkah in his gospel account, and he intentionally mentions it in association with Yeshua. And so we're going to dive into that, um, but we're going we're to start with the big question. What is Hanukkah anyway? Most people are familiar with Hanukkah, you know, at least the elements of it. We have a nine-branched menorah or candelabra. That's what the word menorah means. It just means candelabra, candlestick. Uh, and what else do we typically associate with Hanukkah? We've got dreidels, right? You spin them. Uh, That's how we teach our kids to gamble at a young age. Uh, (laughs) Fried foods, donuts, and latkes. Um, And uh, just like the elements that we typically associate in this country with Christmas, like Christmas trees or mistletoe or or presents, these things, these elements that these holidays are known for came much, 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 much later. Much later. Um, They weren't part of the origin story. And so we're going to talk about the origin story of Hanukkah. What is the history of it? The story of Hanukkah takes place somewhere around 165 uh, BCE or BC um, during the time when the Seleucid Greek Empire uh, had taken control over Judea, Israel. After Alexander the Great conquered the known world, uh, when he died, his entire conquered nation, if you will, or the nation that now the Greek Empire, was divided up among his four generals. Uh, and one of those kingdoms, the Seleucid Empire, came and, and took over or managed, uh, a little bit of fighting, but let's just say they managed Judea. Uh, Daniel 8 actually uh, presents this story in the form of a prophecy, which is kind of neat. And the stories that we find uh, documented about Hanukkah and its origin, although not necessarily fully historical, uh, but they're found in the apocryphal books of the Maccabees, which are still contained in the Catholic Bible. Um, uh, still not thought of to be inspired scripture, but just stories that are helpful uh, when you're reading scripture. Um, And so, yeah, like I said, the story takes place with the Greeks coming in and they are taking control. They've taken control over Judea. The Jews are there where they're presiding. Um, And the Greeks, the thing about the Greeks is they thought very highly of themselves. They thought they had the best culture. They thought they had the newest modern stuff, um, ways of doing things. Uh, And for the most part, in a secular point of view, they absolutely did, Um, world-changing, and their line of thinking, uh, their philosophy, and so on and so forth. But they wanted to bring this this culture and this lifestyle to the Jews in Judea, Um, and many Judeans embraced it, you know? It was the cool hipster thing to do at the time, and uh, they embraced it. But the thing is, the Greeks, when looking at the Jews and their culture and their traditions and how they did things... They didn't really appreciate many aspects of it. Circumcision, for example. Why would you destroy your body, right? Um, as the, the kosher dietary laws, not eating the pig, but it tastes good. Why wouldn't you do that? Um, and even their, their, their general faith and how they perceived their God and the keeping of Torah. And so the story of the Maccabees tells us that the Greeks began to put pressure on the Jews at that time. Um, and this pressure increased until it was practically uh, uh, it was oppression and persecution to get the Jews to abandon their status as the covenant people of God uh, and put away the Torah, just delete the Torah from their lives and embrace Greek culture and Greek faith and Greek philosophy. And this pressure increased until a battle broke out, uh, an all-out war broke out, if you will, and the Greeks and the Jews fought and the Greek army was led by a man named Antiochus, uh, or Antiochus Epiphanes, which literally means Epiphanes, uh, like Epiphany, uh, God manifest. God is manifest, proclaimed himself as God. And one of the things the, Greek did, the Greeks did on the 25th day of the winter month of Kislev is, uh, well, the book's right, they erected a pagan altar on top of the altar in the temple. And right there in the courts, and they sacrificed to a pagan god. Uh, a few verses earlier indicates that uh, most likely it was a pig that they offered. So imagine, if that's the case, they come in to the holy temple of God, full of the, the set-apartness and the status, the kedusha uh, of holiness, and they set up 
an altar on top of the altar of God and they spill the blood of a pig there in the altar, on the courts, and so on and so forth. Um, quite a big deal, if you will. Quite a big deal. And this was a huge abomination, naturally. This sacred place had been completely defiled. And battle after battle, the priestly family, uh, the Hasmoneans, otherwise referred to as the Maccabees, uh, begin to claim victory over the Greeks, battle after battle, until eventually they pushed the Greeks out of Judea. They kind of won. It's a big deal. This is on par with like a scene out of Braveheart. Um, imagine pushing, you know, we're going to push the English out of Scotland. Freedom. Okay. This is what took place. And then in chapter four of the book of 1 Maccabees, uh, the people return to the temple and they're heartbroken because they walk into this place that represents heaven on earth, the place where the glory of God creates a crater in, in this place and where you go and have intimate worship with the Father. And bushes are sprang up, shrubs everywhere. They go inside the temple and unspeakable awful things have taken place there and things are still there. Um, and so they get some bleach and they begin to scrub. They begin to scrub and clean all this up. But the issue they had was with the altar. Because it would have been very difficult to ignore the fact that a pig was sacrificed on top of the altar of God. I mean, imagine. Imagine them reintroducing sacrifices in worship. And they're, they're reintroducing the festivals and the feast days. And they're sacrificing these animals and praising God. But in the back of their minds, pig blood was all over that. Um, what do we do about that? They knew they would remember what the Greeks did. And so they did what anyone would do. They got a big sledgehammer. And they went to swinging. And they knocked the altar down. And they, they got all the stones and they moved them out of the courts. Um, and... Uh, and they went outside and they collected unhewed stones as the Torah commands, and they rebuilt a brand new altar. And on the very same day, the 25th day of the month of Kislev, they rededicated this altar to God and them going to connect with their God. And when they looked in scripture, tried to figure out, okay, we've never, we've never dedicated or rededicated an altar before. How did these things take place? So they're going through the Torah and they're going through the books they had. And in 1 Kings, 1 Kings, they read about the very first temple that King Solomon dedicated. And they read about this altar that was built there. And so they read about how King Solomon, during the eight days of the Feast of Tabernacles, dedicated the temple and its altar. So in like manner, they too held an eight-day festival of dedication. And that's what the word Hanukkah means. It simply means to dedicate or dedication. It's the Hebrew word for dedicate. And uh, that's also why Hanukkah lasts eight days. Kind of an underwhelming explanation, I know, but that's why. It was a celebration of Sukkot. And the books of the Maccabees say that because they, they didn't celebrate Sukkot, they weren't able to celebrate Sukkot along with many other feast days, they felt it was appropriate. You know what? We're not waiting another year to have a party and to reflect on the joy and the grace that God's given to us, to even allow us this victory, but most importantly, to rededicate this place that was so defiled that it would be once again an accepting of him and we can join in worshiping and reconnect in relationship with our God the way that they saw it. Now, kind of a nerdy fact. Can we do some nerd stuff? Yeah, yeah that card, I need to pull my card out. It's in my truck, I need to start pulling it out. Um, the nerdy fact is, or, or the question is, what did the Maccabees do with uh, the stones that made up the altar that was defiled? What did they do? Well, in verse uh, 46 of 1 Maccabees chapter 4, it tells us what they did, right? And I think we have a slide, hopefully. 1 Maccabees 4, 46. And they laid up the stones in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place. So imagine that. It's just, guys, what are we going to do with these temples? Oh, man, we could probably put them up on that high shelf. That's inconvenient. This is more convenient. I don't know. That's just a convenient place. Until there should come a prophet to show what should be done with them. They didn't know what to do with the stones. I mean, I don't know. Just throw them away. You know, whatever. Just throw them away. They didn't know what to do with the stones. They, they, they felt like they needed to store them. They'd never been through this situation before. 
they knew they needed to rebuild it, but what are they supposed to do with the old stones that have been sanctified for temple use? They have a level of holiness or kedusha attributed to them despite their defiled status. It's kind of, it's kind of like when, when, yeah, oh man, that's good. And we're going to let Heather come up here and take the message because that's so good, just like us. Gosh, next year is a Hanukkah message. Thank you. Anyone, so, so those of us who, those of you who, who may be the generation that actually has a physical Bible, right? I know there's judgment to those of us who typically read on the computer screen. Um, but you ever have an old Bible that you dedicated a lot of time and energy to? And over time, this Bible ages, not like fine wine. It starts falling apart, right? Pages are ripped up or crinkled, and then you open it up, and the binding on the back's cracking, and then finally it'll rip, it'll just fall off. The cover's already off. You're trying to carry it around. It falls apart, missing pages. So what do you do? You just throw it away, right, and get a new Bible? Why don't you throw the Bible away that's falling apart and really isn't that useful because it's falling apart? It's, it's not worth You're not going to use it again. Why not just throw it in the trash? It has a level of perceived holiness about it, Right? And so this is the same type of idea with these stones. We can't just throw them away. So they took the stones and they stored them where they were sanctified to be, on the Temple Mount. They stored them in a special room. Um, And so, uh, yeah, it was a special chamber called the Lishkat uh, HaKaramot, or the Chamber of Tokens, if you will. This is where... Uh, tokens or seals uh, that were exchanged for money for people to purchase like libations such as flour and wine, various offerings. So it was in this back room, I think in the far right corner of, of the Temple Mount. Um, regardless, so in the next uh, Bible trivia at Applebee's, you will, you will know the answer to that. The point being is that it was a really big deal. The altar was rebuilt, it was dedicated, but the holiness, despite the stones having a level of defilement in association with what took place, um, they couldn't be disregarded. And so they kept them there until a prophet would come one day and tell them what in the world to do with them. Now, this is a story of Hanukkah. When the world was in its darkest moments and the beautiful grace of God opened up for the opportunity of rededication, of communion. And there's a misconception about Hanukkah and why it is celebrated. Many people uh, assume that it is celebrated because of the military victory of the Maccabees, uh, which was another name for the priestly family that revolted, the Hasmoneans, the, the family that led the revolt. But that's not really why Hanukkah is celebrated. Those are things that people celebrate and honor along with it, uh, but that's not really, really why. Um, the core reason wasn't about liberty or freedom, fighting back. It wasn't about uh, the fact that they could now keep Torah again. No, Maccabees, uh, 1 Maccabees chapter 4, verse 59 uh, tells us, What provoked this celebration to continue year after year? Then Judas and his brothers and all the assembly of Israel determined that every year at that season, the days of dedication of the altar should be observed with joy and gladness for eight days, beginning on the 25th day of the month of Kislev. The focus is that every year they will remember that despite what happens, despite how hard it is, there is always an opportunity for rededication. This is the day that we remember that the impossible was overshadowed by God's power. And Hanukkah remembers that. That when the altar was defiled, restoration and rededication was not too far out of reach. There was always hope. And it's appropriate during this time to reflect on that. To reflect on, uh, and this may be sound kind of like a cheesy metaphor, I don't care, it's impactful. Reflect on your own altar. And the altar of your heart. What have you been offering to God? What have you been offering to God? Is there defilement there? Is there something that needs to be torn down and rededicated with a new start? And so we're going to jump over to John chapter 10, and uh, we're going to read the Word of God today. (laughs) Uh, So we're going to start in verse 22. So if you would turn on your Bibles or turn in your Bibles uh, to John chapter 10, we're just going to read a couple verses here. And we're going to read the section of when Yeshua finds himself in the temple during the season of Hanukkah or the time of Hanukkah. But we're going to read a little bit more to discover what happens and why John is emphasizing this entire uh, entire event. The gospel writers don't have to tell us everything that happened. 
they picked and chose what they wanted to present and how to present it. Um, and so that's why it's important. It's not just a, something that finds itself in the Bible. Starting in verse 22, then came the festival of dedication, Hanukkah, at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you didn't believe me. The works I do in my Father's name testify about who I am. But you do not believe because you're not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, verse 31, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. That escalated real quick. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. Which of these do you stone me for? We are not stoning you for any good work that you've done, they replied, but for blasphemy because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I have said you are God's. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came from and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy because I said I am, I am God's son? Do not believe me unless I do the works of my father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I in the father. Again, they became triggered and tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. All right, everybody good? Yeshua is in Jerusalem during the Feast of Hanukkah, walking in Solomon's colonnade. And as I said, John is very intentional about how he sets up his account of the gospel of Yeshua. Each author of the gospel accounts acted as a film director when they began to write or hired someone else to write the account. Uh, dictate it, I mean, or, or transcribe it. Each one emphasizes specific details and events of Yeshua's ministry that are intended to navigate you as the reader to the aspect of Yeshua that they wanted to emphasize most. Right? It's their movie that they're presenting to you. Some of them even move events around in their movie so that they can emphasize a point that they feel is bigger than where the event occurred or how it occurred. Uh, Jesus flipping tables in the temple, for example. Everybody knows the scene? Walks in there, whip, animals flying everywhere. Oh, get out. Flipping tables over, coins everywhere. Matthew and Mark, in these accounts, they both depict Yeshua driving out the money changers at the end of his ministry. Right? It's the next thing he does after riding in as this king about to triumph over, uh, over the enemy uh, on a donkey in Jerusalem. After this occurs, next thing, next king. As king, we're going to clean up this temple. Runs in there. All kinds of a commotion. In John, however, in John's film, this incident is how Yeshua launches his entire ministry. It's like the first thing he does. He, he turns water into wine, and then he walks into the temple and drives everyone out. And some people get really upset when they read that, why isn't it at the end of his ministry in John? Why, why is the Bible contradicting or changing? And, um, and this comes from possibly just having or being ingrained of a more fundamentalistic mindset um, when we get really upset when the gospel accounts don't line up or details don't line up and we forget they're different authors painting different pictures and there's a bigger picture to be painted. I don't believe the Bible contradicts itself. I think that it's beautifully written. We forget that the entire Bible is this collection, a library of books and letters and parables and wisdom literature and actual accounts by people. It was written by people, humans that were inspired by God to write it. And the authors were not simply writing stuff down randomly. It was intentional. Just because it's sometimes a big deal for us doesn't mean it was a big deal for them. 
And so John, what is he emphasizing throughout his gospel account? What are the big things that he emphasizes throughout his movie? Well, one of the biggest things in his account is the deity of Yeshua. Like that's something he hammers. He is divine, God, manifest. John emphasizes him as also only being the true light. That word comes up a lot. 23 times in his book, seven times at the beginning of the opening chapter. Seven, probably intentional. He is the true light that brings forth the presence of God to all mankind. The other big thing that John emphasizes in his account specifically, more so than the others, is him being the true temple. The true temple. The true place where heaven meets earth. And so naturally, he starts his ministry out by emphasizing the corruptness going on in the earthly temple and his zeal for the place where God's holiness and peace are supposed to flow from. And I think that's absolutely beautiful. This is, of course, how he would start his ministry. I love that. Something else that John does is he, he, he uses the feast days and structures them in a way that uplifts Yeshua being an ultimate culmination of their purpose. Um, for example, specifically three, Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, and I believe Hanukkah. Uh, in John chapter six, uh, John frames this incident out as Yeshua being this greater fulfillment of Passover. Uh, we see this in John chapter six, starting in verse three. It says, uh, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. And what happens next? You have this huge crowd of people that just appears in the story out of nowhere and they're hungry for bread. And just like, just like the first Exodus account, if you will, people in the wilderness, hungry for bread. And here Yeshua brings forth the miracle of the fish sandwiches. He feeds everyone with bread and fish, right? Verse 31, here's their response. Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, verily, truly, verily, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread of heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives you life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. John did not have to tell us that it was near the time of Passover for this story to still have this impact of him being the bread of life. He didn't have to, to put that as the foundation, but he did. So we have John associating Yeshua with being the bread that brings forth life, associated with the Exodus account, inaugurating this type of new Passover or greater Passover or greater Exodus that he is inaugurating. You also have John associating Yeshua with the Feast of Tabernacles in the very next chapter. We go from Passover to the Feast of Tabernacles in one chapter, starting in verse 11. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? So here John is intentionally drawing your attention to this festival. John is structuring his account of Yeshua a certain way. So we can expect him to link Yeshua to Sukkot in some way during this chapter. Majority of the chapter is a discussion about who Yeshua is and the debate between himself and the religious leaders around him. Um, and here is what happens in verse 37. On the last greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let everyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that point, or up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And here, on hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man's a prophet. And others said, no, he is the Messiah. So we know there was a water libation, a water pouring ceremony that took place during the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's inferred here that Yeshua is focusing that onto himself, using the same keywords and language that are associated with the water pouring ceremony that took place at the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles. This grand spectacle. And, uh, and here Yeshua is saying that, no, no, I, I, am the one, I am the true embodiment of what this feast represents. I am the one who quenches the thirst from within. So John associates Yeshua with the ultimate fulfillment of Passover, 
and the ultimate fulfillment of the second or greater exodus. And John is now some way, shape, or form associating Yeshua with the ultimate fulfillment of the greater meaning behind the Feast of Tabernacles, where, where God took care of us in the exodus event, in the wilderness, and God dwelled among us. Love that. It's a time to ask for the blessing of rain so that we would not be parched and our land would not be parched. Truly a sign of God's graciousness and a salvation to his people. But here, standing before us, is the ultimate fulfillment of God's graciousness and salvation poured out for his people, which is Yeshua. And then we come to chapter 10. And here, let's see here. So so Passover week is a week-long festival with unleavened bread. And then we go to Sukkot, and that's another week-long festival, right? And John now takes us to chapter 10 where we have another festival going on, Hanukkah, which is another week-long festival festival. It's kind of three. It's kind of neat. And of course, the context here is once again is, I believe, who is the fullness of the person of Yeshua. That's what everybody's been contending with the entire story. Who are you? Tell us plainly. Just let us know. Let us know. And how does Yeshua answer this request for him to just tell him? I did tell you, but you didn't believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Earlier in the chapter, he proclaims that he is the good shepherd. It's a reference from Isaiah 34 that is actually attributed to Yahweh himself. Right? John's doing that on purpose. He's, he's, he's expounding on the times when Yeshua referred to things in the Bible, in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, that were directly associated with God. I am the good shepherd, he says. Why is this significant? Why is it significant that Yeshua is here in Jerusalem during the time of Hanukkah? And not only that, standing in the courts, it is here that he claims to be the giver of true life, eternal life. Not only that, it's here where he claims that he is the shepherd and that God gives all of the flock over to him. Not only that, he goes on to claim that him and the Father are one. Man. This triggers the Jewish opponents that are at this this group. And what do they do? Verse 31. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. Which one are you going to stone me over this time? It's in the first time they picked up. We're not stoning you for any good work. Blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Claim to be God, a man claiming to be God. Who else claimed to be God during the Hanukkah motif? Antiochus Epiphanes, the leader of the Greeks that tormented the Jews during the time of the Maccabees. So you have a fake representation of of God manifest, found in Antiochus Epiphanes, and the Jews rejected him. But here you have the true presence of God in human form. And this group of Jews rejects him as well. See, this is the issue Yeshua has been contending with for several chapters now. There are groups of people here that have an issue with Yeshua and they can't tell the fake apart from the legitimate. They can't tell. They can't tell the difference between the Yeshua and the Antiochus. The word here that John uses for stone him, they picked up stones to stone him. It's kind of neat. It's only found in two other places in the Hebrew Bible. It's 1 Samuel 16, 4 and verse 13. And both times it's in the context of a descendant of Saul, enemy of David, picking up stones to throw at the Davidic king. It's kind of neat. And I'd like to think that that was intentional by John. I'd like to make that connection and stretch it. I don't know, but I'd, I'd like to think that. You have King David having stones thrown at him, and then you have people who are opposed to the true Davidic king picking up stones to throw at him. Now, Hanukkah, the dedication of the altar, is the core meaning. But the good works of the Maccabees were also honored during this time, right? Here are the, the, the soldiers who stood up in the face of this persecution, But here, the enemies of Yeshua wish to stone him. Again, the true Davidic Messiah for his good works. 
or despite his good works. Guys, there's so many possible contrasts going on here. I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The works that I do are given to me by the Father. They are my Father's works. Yeshua also hammers the point that the true sheep hear his voice. There are sheep that do not know his voice. Let that sink in. There are other sheep that are not listening to his voice. Not all sheep are part of the flock of Yeshua. He tells his opposition here in verse 26 that y'all are, you fall in that category. You're not my sheep. You are not my, because you do not believe. You're not part of my flock. Which is kind of neat because we always think of anyone who's like outside, those are wolves. Everyone's a wolf who's not part of, no. We have themes of rededication, themes of not knowing God enough to distinguish the fake from the real. You have an intentional turning away from the evidence Yeshua presents you with, his works. And here we see that there are sheep that may be in the same field as his flock, may be following or wandering after the shepherd, but they're not his. They are not truly in his fold despite appearances. Yeshua goes on to say that no one can snatch his flock from his hand. He then says he gives them eternal life. No one can snatch them out of his hand. I love that verse. It's such a, a comforting metaphor, right? Just, I love that. No one can snatch us away from our shepherd. This phrase is actually found in the book of Psalms. John seems to be doing what John is supposed to be doing, directing a movie, and he's hyperlinking us back to Psalms when he emphasizes, I believe, this saying from Yeshua. And it happens in Psalm 95. And we're going to unpack most of this chapter because he's linking us back to this one verse because he wants to show us the context of the entire chapter. I am making that assumption. Of, I believe it's obvious. Psalm chapter 95, and we'll start. You can start in verse 1, but we're going to start in, in verse 6 just to condense it a little bit. And it says this in verse 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Some of your translations may say uh, something like, we are secure in his presence or comforted by his security. But in the Hebrew, it is literally, uh, and here in the NASV, uh, B, it says, uh, we are sheep of his hand. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness. Love that. Sheep of his hand. When your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work, for 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who goes astray in their heart and they do not know my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, you shall not enter my rest. So Psalm 95 is speaking about the greatness of God and it refers to the Exodus account. So the people singing and praising God and proclaiming that, that they are the people of his pasture and also saying they are the sheep within his hand. They are part of his flock. We are safe. We have entered into his blessing and his promise. We are the ones that hear his voice, I believe in verse seven. But then the chapter turns a bit grim. It's like a very sudden transition to something that's a bit, a bit darker in recounting the Exodus account for the first generation that resisted. And what's it say? Though they had seen my work, they had seen my works, they still do not believe. They do not hear his voice. That's exactly what's happening in John chapter 10. This is it. This little reference in John unpacks just so much more. It's like one of those zip files. You unzip and extract. It, it unpacks this chapter that is speaking of the same thing happening during Hanukkah with Yeshua. There is a flock that is within his hand. They know his voice. And there are sheep that don't believe, despite them seeing his works. And those are the ones that do not enter his rest. The greater exodus that has been inaugurated by Yeshua just like the first exodus has two groups of people. 
Those who murmured, those who complained, those who refused to endure to the end, those who refused to believe and grab hold of the promises of God and his salvation, and they were left in the wilderness. And there's another group that pushed forward and that dared boldly to enter into the promised land, the land of his rest. John chapter 10, verse 36, Yeshua is speaking and he says, are you saying of him whom the Father sanctified or set apart and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am a son of God? So here Yeshua is displayed as the true agent of God amongst this controversy. Here Yeshua claims to be sanctified by God himself. While he's standing in the temple courts where the altar that was sanctified and rededicated during the Hanukkah event, or that birth to Hanukkah event. But here, he is the one that is dedicated for this purpose. He is the one that's sanctified. Just these little, in the language, fire, I mean, coals on like the heads of his opposition. Just you could tell like, is he, is he, did he say that directly? Just pick up the stones. <laughs> Just pick them up. I feel, I have feelings and emotions. Just pick them up. Here Yeshua is displayed as that true agent that is sanctified. And he's rejected. Uh, scholar Craig Keener points out an interesting fact here uh, that relates back to our point that, God, uh, that John is, is, is directing a movie. Um, we as the audience know things about Yeshua and that his opposition during this time doesn't. Right? We're outside the film looking in. We already know the story. We know the details, right? So it's not like we're finding out different things. Um, We know that he's divine. He's deity. John 1, 1 in in verse 18, right? His opposition isn't getting that. Here his opposition is rejecting the God of Israel and their claims of him making himself uh, a human to be God is also backwards because as we read John 1, 14, Yeshua is not making himself to be God, but God already made human, this divine representation or manifestation. John beautifully paints Yeshua as being the greater fulfillment or Passover and Exodus. He portrays Yeshua as being the greater fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. Sukkot represented the journey through the wilderness. Again, he is the bread that rained down from heaven. He is the water that gives true life. And here in John 10, I believe we see Yeshua being the fulfillment of the Hanukkah event a time when lines were blurred, where war was going on, there was lots of uncertainty, where there was one that stood up proclaiming himself as God and convincing many in Israel to follow him, apostates to the faith. A time when victory was won and a place that was not fit to worship the Lord was rededicated and sanctified so that the people of God could once again celebrate before God's presence fully in spirit and in truth. Here, Yeshua is that sanctified place where we find God's presence. Despite the war, despite the chaos, despite the confusing leadership that tells us to go one way or go another and ignore his works, Yeshua says, I am the place where you find rest because he is the good shepherd. On the day that is celebrating holiness and grace of God found in the rededication and the restoration of the temple, and the altar, that John is pointing out greater fulfillment of rededication of both is happening. It is happening. The restoration of a place where God and man meet, the meeting place of heaven and earth, is Yeshua. And look at where John says Yeshua is. He's in Solomon's colonnade. He's in the place that the Greeks trampled. He's in the place where the Greeks spilt the blood of the swine before God where the abomination took place. And he now stands as the good shepherd, as king, as the image of God in the midst of all of Israel. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget about who our shepherd is. That's what Heather was just talking about. Are we really anticipating the fullness of who God is? Do we really have that impact? Sometimes we forget the sound of his voice. And sometimes we trick ourselves into thinking that God is in this place when he's really not. 
And so we dwell there. Sometimes we just get distracted. We get distracted with so much stuff in the world. Aren't there a lot of distractions outside? Golly, there's so many distractions. It's, oh man. So many things that we have the opportunity to devote our attention and energy, get all excited and anxious about. So many things that we have the opportunity to stop everything that God is calling us towards and our purpose of being here and fulfilling that mandate to stop and pause it all so that we can get all anxious about stuff, get distracted. Yeah. We get distracted with judging other people instead of loving other people. We get distracted by what the billboards on our televisions tell us. We get the distractions of the weight of unexpected things that happen in our lives. Sometimes we get distracted because of sin in our lives that we just don't want to deal with. So we look for distractions so we don't have to deal with it. Sometimes our routine is stripped from us and we are so vain to think that our comfort is more important than building loving relationships in the name of Yeshua. What has entered into our life that has caused our altar to be defiled before God? What have we held on to? I've purged all the sin and distractions from my life except that shoebox sin that's up in the corner of the closet. I like to ignore it. Collects dust, but we want to keep it. We're going to have a party tomorrow for the Feast of Dedication in light of Yeshua, through the lens of Yeshua. And it's going to be fun. But right now, I'm begging you to take a look and consider what you're offering to God in your life, what you're offering to God in this season, this season that many of us lose motivation for just about everything. God can meet you where you're at, but not where you're pretending to be. And I believe this is what the story of Hanukkah teaches us. It's the same thing that Yeshua teaches us. And so if there's something in your life that you do need to grab a sledgehammer and tear it down in order to rebuild something fresh to be an offering of God, gosh, do it. Do it. Do it. Knock it down. Knock it down today. And instead of trying to rebuild it yourself, just cry out to God. Make me the offering that you would want me to be in this world. That there would be no defilement, that there would be no corruption, that there would be nothing that is fake. Give it up. Now is an appropriate season to do such a thing. I'd like to end with a quote uh, by Victor J. Donovan uh, in his article on Hanukkah and the birth of Christ. And worship team, you guys can come up as we conclude services. Um, Let us use these thoughts, therefore, on the Hanukkah of old in order to make our Advent a truly messianic one leading up to God's birth among men. Then will be fulfilled the words of the prophet Isaiah saying, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. To them that dwell in the region of the shadow of death, light is risen. People will see the great light, Jesus Christ shining in our lives. In him, through him, and with him shall all the lights of Hanukkah burst forth in all of their prophetic brilliance. Upon a crib, upon a cross, and upon a crown of glory.